you know what I mean when I said you were not Hindu, didn't I? Reincarnation. <laughs> you might have killed your grandma. <laughs> oh, Lordy. But uh, remember uh, Sunday, really be praying, and then Sunday night Bible school starts, and, and uh, do pray for revival. I'm telling you, uh, uh, we're in desperate need of a spiritual return. I was, got a little thing from Providence Academy, which is a Christian school here, in Johnson City, and I was reading it a while ago, and they were given a story. You've heard me talk about James Dewey, or not James Dewey, John Dewey, which was the founder of the progressive humanistic educational system in America. And uh, we've gone a long way from the days of traditional uh, biblical Christianity in our country. And uh, I still believe, as I stated, I think it was Sunday night, uh, Christianity has not failed. Christians have failed. Christianity has still worked today. It still worked today. But uh, do pray, uh, Bible school, and uh, we... Uh, we're looking forward to a great Bible school. If our men have come tonight, we're receiving our Wednesday night offering, uh, raising the money for uh, Brother Scott to go to Israel with us. And uh, if you are going with us, Sister Doris called. She uh, signed up. Uh, they're signing up now to go with us. And uh, if you're uh, if you're uh, thinking about or contemplating going to Israel with us in November, let me encourage you to uh, uh, to go ahead and get registered because this thing's filling up. And uh, uh, we hope after this week we're still going to have openings and all. And uh, But later we can probably get you there, but you're not going to be able to fly as a group. You're probably going to have to go on a different airline. And it will probably be an increase in cost. So if you're planning on going with us, just go ahead and get registered, all right? All right. So uh, Brother Scott, uh, uh, I know it would be a blessing to him. I tell you, going to the Holy Land, to me, was like going to two years Bible college. That's what it was like to me. My Bible came alive. My Bible came alive. So let me encourage you to do that. All right. Let's pray tonight and ask the blessing on the giving and service tonight. God to meet with us in a special way. Brother Jerry's sick tonight down his back. Remember him. Uh, Brother Charles Biggs, would you pray for us tonight? Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Hope you got your Bible tonight and turn with us to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. As we've been a journey already in Romans, uh, Colin and I were eating uh, dinner at the Golden Corral, and uh, he was asking me about uh, uh, Rob this morning was talking about uh, the book of Judges, and I said, well, the book of Judges is a book of confusion, and Colin asked me, he said, does every book in the Bible have a theme? And I said, yes, and he said, what's the theme in the book of Romans? And I said, justification, but literally, let me say it uh, a little more in depth, I think really it's in salvation, but out of salvation you've got what? Justification, sanctification, and ultimately one day, glorification. And uh, the book of Romans starts and tells us about what sin is. If you look at those first three chapters, uh, uh, sin, uh, unrighteousness, and then you come to chapter 4 and you see that Abraham is a man that is justified by faith. Chapter 4 and 5 is having to deal with justification. And Romans 6, 7, and 8 is telling us how to live in victory and overcome our Adamic flesh. Let me have you know when you got saved, uh, your flesh did not get eradicated. Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you can still get mad? Huh? Yeah. How many can still lose your cool? Yeah, yeah. Let somebody cut you off on the road and see how much you lose your cool. Yeah, yeah. We we still we still have a sinful nature. We have been declared uh, righteous, judicially righteous in the presence of holy God, but we still live in a sinful world and still have uh, a sinful nature that has not been glorified yet. But you remember chapter nine, ten, eleven is dealing with Israel. Nine is Israel's past. Israel's, uh, Romans 10 is Israel's presence. Romans 11 is Israel's future. And then we've come to chapter 12. Chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15 is dealing with the Christian's conduct, how we're to conduct ourselves. How, you remember Sunday night we preached on are we going to be a powerful church or a powerless church? And we talked about our character in Acts chapter 1. We talked about our conduct in Acts chapter 2. And we talked about the evidence of our lives in the world of making a difference in Acts chapter number 3. Tonight, we pick up in verse number 3. We've, we spent almost two lessons on verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a what? Living sacrifice. That we are to give ourselves totally and completely unto the Lord, and we're to be transformed by the power of God. We're to be being continually transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is what our conduct's supposed to be. Who are we supposed to act like? What are we called tonight? Christians. Christians. They first were called Christians at Antioch. Why were they called Christians? Because they were Christ-like. They were manifesting this life of Christ. You know, I, I find sometimes there's people would rather be a Baptist than be a Christian. I'm glad that Christ got a hold of me before the Baptist got a hold of me. It wasn't the Baptist changed me, it was Christ that changed me. The only thing that makes me a Christian, the only thing that makes anybody a Christian is Christ in them, the hope of glory. Now we come to verse 3 uh, in our study tonight, and it's talking about the believer and himself. Uh, you know, how do, we, how do we see ourselves? How many of you know how you see yourself determines a lot about what, how you conduct, the conduct of your life and, and the, the image. By the way, we've all got an image of ourselves. Amen? Some of you sitting here tonight thinking, well, I'm so ugly, nobody wouldn't look at me. And then some of you sitting here saying, I'm so good looking, I just shake the world when they look at me. Huh? 
And now listen, listen to what verse 3 has to say in our, our text tonight. He said, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, uh, to think but to think soberly accordingly as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, stop and think just a moment. Uh, thinking of yourself. Uh, there's a problem. There's a problem with some folks. They think too high of themselves, right? And then there's another problem. People think too low of themselves. Let me give you a statement tonight. I hope you never forget. God did not create you for a pile of junk. But you're not like everybody else. How many of you are glad that all of us aren't like Kenneth Loveless? Huh? Amen? I mean, I, I mean, all right, how many of you are so glad that, that we're all not like Charles Biggs? We got more votes there. Huh? And, and, and the thing about we're all different. Now, what we're getting ready to look at here in the next uh, little bit in the Bible study, you know what? We're to accept people for who they are, not for what we want to make them. And, and, and it's not up to me to make people. That's between them and God. God is the maker. God is the sustainer. And, 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 and if, if, if I make you what I want you to be, you're not going to be what God would have you to be. So he, he said here, he said, uh, don't, don't think too highly of yourself. Now, there's a lot of people in the world thinks, I'm so important, the world can't live without me. I've had some church members in 47 years. Now, I'm going to tell you something, preacher. When I leave this church, its doors are going closed. They left and business picked up. What was the problem? They thought they were the hub that everything run on. And without them, it would go under. See, there's people that think they're too important. Uh, there's people that, uh, that think they're too popular. I mean, they look at their popularity and who they are and what they've done, and they've got, they've got this Castafo nose that looks down and belittles others that are not where they ought to be. We were pulling out of Golden Crown, and Todd's, I mean, uh, Colin said, boy, that fella needs some tires. I said, it might be a poor man trying to make it the next payday. We don't know. Hey, the thing about it is, uh, don't criticize the other feller until you've walked two miles in his shoes. Don't criticize the other man until you've walked two miles in his shoes. You don't, you don't know what that he might be going through. You know, there's people who think, my position, boy, where I am and what I've accomplished and what I've done, and they look at themselves in that way and they look down at us. Uh, they look at their abilities and their talents. Man, I can sing and the preacher can't. Hoop, hooly do. I don't sing to you no way. Hey, a lot of people, their wealth, they, they, they think, man, I'm better because of the house I live in, the car that I drive, the clothes that I wear. And, and, and today, you, you've, got, you've got people fighting over, over the kind of shoes. They, and I tell you what they ought to have to go back and do sometime. Go to school uh, with the soles wore out of them, and you have to put cardboard in the bottom of them or put one of them old uh, red uh, uh, jar rings around them to hold the bottom on while you go to school. Amen? Yeah. And walk three miles uphill all the way, didn't you? Uh, you know, uh, some people look down because of the education they've got. Look, this verse, look at it. He said, For I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to. But what are we, how are we to think? We're to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. By the way, 
you didn't make you and you didn't give you what you have and you're to be thankful for God for everything that you've got not look down at somebody else that don't have what you've got. Hey, the doorkeeper back there, faithfulness. You know what God's going to honor? Faithfulness. 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 Let me ask you something. How many of you believe faithfulness is important? Oh, let me me ask you a question. How many of you, if you had a car and you went out four mornings out of seven and it didn't start, how many of you would keep that car? Huh? But we expect... We expect to serve God showing up when we want to, right? Yeah, right. Huh? Yeah. I, I mean, wouldn't this, the whole subject we're getting into here, gifts and all, is in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In, in the church, there shouldn't be no big eyes and little U's. If one of us is hurting, we all ought to be hurting. If one of us is crying, we all ought to be crying. If one's a life and we all, hey, listen, we are in this thing as a body. If the church would get back to function and like the Bible teaches the church, the church would touch the world. The world would look and say, my goodness, look at how them people take care of one another. Oh, listen, and, 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 and he talks about, he said, uh, uh, soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Look what he says, just the statement I got through making in verse 4. For as we have many members in what? The church is how many bodies? One body. The church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is one body. And all members have not the same what? I want to ask you something tonight. Does all of your, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and read there about how that he uses the analogy of our body to that of the church. Hey, my right arm needs the rest of my body, and the rest of my body needs what? My right arm. And he talks about in in the body there, there's some essentials in the body. My heart, my heart, my liver, there's the essentials that I've got to have to be able to stay physically alive. And there's the essentials in the church that the church has to, uh, to have uh, uh, to be able. But every part of my body needs the rest of it. You say, well, uh, there's some parts of my body is not as important. That is true. But I want to tell you something. You might not think your toes are important. Cut them all off and see the difference in trying to walk. You might think your little thumb is not very important. Cut that thumb off and see how that thumb is. Hey, every member in the body of Christ, the church, is important in your position. And what we need to learn... Now, can everybody be the preacher? Can everybody be the song director? Can everybody be the teacher? But every one of us can do what we're supposed to do And what he's trying to teach us here, we need to find out what our gifts are and get busy to using them. See, we are all one body in Christ. Oh, listen. Now now look at verse 5. For we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. Having then gifts differently according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. Our minister, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Or he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. That uh, he that ruleth with diligently, he that showeth mercy with what? Cheerfulness. Now, if you're saved tonight, If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have at least one gift. How many understand that? You have at least one spiritual gift. That's according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives you an in-depth list too of gifts. Some of them them are no longer in, uh, in action in the church. The gift, I do not believe the gift of tongues is still in the church. 
I do not believe the gift of healing is still in the church, and I do not believe the gift of prophecy is there. Why? We've got the completeness of the canonization of Scripture, and that was given those gifts. Now, until that we had the completeness of the canonization of the Scriptures of the Bible, but the rest of the gifts are in action, and he gives us some of them here in, in our text tonight that we've read. The first one that he gives us is the gift of, of prophecy, the gift of prophecy. In the Old Testament, the gift of prophecy was the gift of proclaiming and explaining the will of God. The proclamation dealt with past, present, and future events. However, in the New Testament, the gift of prophecy changed drastically. The prophet is seldom seen predicting the future. Hey, listen. The only prediction of the future today is found word. In the word of God. Hey, listen, if I go out here and prophesy and tell you something's going to happen, it don't happen, what am I supposed to be done if I'm going back and trying to live under the prophecy of the Old Testament? How many of you know what's supposed to happen to me? If I go out here and prophesy and say, God gave me this, I'm telling you what God's going to do, and it doesn't come to pass. How many in this congregation knows what was to happen to that person that prophesied? He used to be stoned to death. God has completed the canonization of his scripture, and he said all, hey, listen, this is the danger that we're in today. People begin to perceive and men begin to perceive what they think they're going to have. Listen, in prophecy today, if I'm going to stand up here and teach you prophecy, I'm going to teach it to you from the Word of God. But if I come to an area that I don't know, I better tell you I'm speculating upon it and I really don't know this is what I believe and what I think it is, but I better not lay it down to you this is contrary to what's going to happen. There's some things in prophecy I study constantly and continually. I, 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 I think right now if you ask me tonight, when, when is the battle of Ezekiel going to take place? After the rapture. There's been times that I went back and studied and looked and thought, well, this is going to take place before. But tonight I'm settled on it's going to take place after the rapture takes place. But, but the thing about it is, is, is prophecy today is to come to the place to be able to tell you the truths of God's Word and rightly divide them by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Hey folks, listen to me now. You can get your emotions and you can get your feelings in something that God doesn't have anything to do with. Are you listening to me? Now, listen to me now. If you're running by your feelings, you're like a yo-yo. Huh? I found out a long time ago, I'm not running on my feelings, I'm running on my faith of what God had to say. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's times that I felt like I was going to be raptured and I, I could reach up and touch God in His presence at that time and I went to bed and slept all night and woke up the next morning and felt like I was backslid. <laughs> Amen. But I didn't get up the next morning and start running on my feelings. I got up and said, this is the day the Lord has given me. I can rejoice and be what? Glad in it. This is the day that God has blessed me and His grace is sufficient for my every need and I can trust Him by faith. And I'm going to tell you something. When you step out there and you start walking by faith, it, I mean, I don't run on my feelings, but I'm going to tell you something. Thank God that life gets a whole lot sweeter and I start feeling a whole lot better. Huh? Now. We all got accountability there. You got accountability responsibility. It doesn't matter who you are. You got accountability responsibility. And the thing about it, you better look in the mirror and get your life straight and get your eyes off of everybody else. Hey, the, the worst thing you can do in life is run around looking at everybody else how they're living. You, hey, listen, I ain't going to answer for you. You ain't going to answer for me. 
We better realize one day there's accountability coming before God and we better live today with accountability and responsibility. I got a responsibility to you as a church to be the man of God that I'm supposed to be. I've got accountability to God to do His will for my life. Now, look at this. There is the gift of prophecy, but look at the second gift that's mentioned here. There is the gift of ministry. What does this mean? The gift of ministry. Any of you have any idea what the gift of ministry is? Well, let me ask you something. What does the word deacon mean? <laughs> you got some of them. <laughs> what does the word deacon mean? Servant. Servant. Now, now, now listen, God has endued, I don't believe that, that there's anybody got all the gifts. You know, I don't know how many gifts you got. That's for you to get in the Word of God by prayer and study and the leadership of the Holy Spirit to find out what your gifts are and put them into action. And by the way, if you find out, and if you're sitting here tonight and know what your gifts are and you're not using it, it's like somebody coming in and giving you $1 million tonight and you live 100 years and you never spend one penny of it and you die, what good did the, did the gift uh, uh, do you of a $1 million and never use it? To know your gift is not the thing, to use it. To know it in what? And, and by, by the way, you talk about revival. I believe a revival could break out, and I believe the power of God on a church if people could know their gifts, start using their gifts, and put them into action in the church. Some's got the gift of ministry here. Which, hey, folks, there's somebody, there's people in, the, in, in, in my pastorate for 47 years. Man, I'm going to tell you something. You never did have to ask them to do anything. They were there. They were there. I mean, listen, they were looking to where they could serve, what they could do, how they could honor God. If it was to stand and open the door to the church, they would be there to be a greeter, to open the door, to shake hands. If it was to take a broom and sweep the floor, if it was to get out in the parking lot and pick up trash, whatever it was, they looked around and saw the needs and you didn't have to point it to them. They were there doing it. Amen. The gift of ministry. Listen, it's an ability to minister, to help, to assist, to assist. I mean, you see a need. You see, you see somebody that, that, that's in a need. What do you do? You go help. That's the gift of ministry. Look at the third gift that is mentioned here. There's the gift of teaching. And by the way, tonight your pastor does not have the gift of teaching. I do not have, hey, listen, I wish to God that I had the gift of teaching. Hey, listen, man, I'm going to tell you something. A person with the gift of teaching, you can take the Word of God, and I, that Word, it, it illuminates your mind. It illuminates your heart. I, I mean, listen, I, I, I mean, you, they, they can take and illustrate. Let me tell you the person, the greatest teacher that I ever have said and listened to. Dr. Oliver B. Green. Any of you ever happened to listen to Dr. He's in heaven today. How did Dr. Oliver B. Green teach you God's Word? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Dr. Oliver B. Green never stood and told stories out of his own life. You know where he's told the stories from? The Bible. He would build on one, one, and just, and man, uh, I tell you another one, Warren Wiersbe. Anybody ever happen to listen to Warren Wiersbe or read any of Warren Wiersbe, a few of you? Warren Wiersbe, uh, he, he, he was, the first time I ever heard Warren Wiersbe teach was at Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and, and the Bible Conference, and, and he was teaching through the Psalms. And I'd sit there and I'd listen to that man and how that he made the Word of God just live before you. Dr. R.G. Lee, he could take the Word of God and he could, he could, he could so uh, bring it out that you, you could, it's almost like watching it on a screen that he would 
deliver it to you. But, but there is the gift of, uh, of teaching and, you know, the ability to explain and, 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 and the, uh, uh, the ability to ground people in the truth. I wish I was such a teacher that you never forgot what I taught. Now, I'll prove to you I'm not a teacher. What was three Wednesday nights ago's lesson on? How hey, many were here three Wednesday? Uh, 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 Brother Scott was here the last two Wednesday nights because I was in Alabama. Three Wednesday nights ago from tonight. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. By the mercies of God that you present your body a what? Living sacrifice. And you remember how, you remember the, how many of you remember the teenager sitting in here? And how many of you remember how that we got down to the rap music and the rock music and, and the different musics and the philosophies of the world? Huh? You weren't here? The teenagers were here on that Wednesday night. Huh? Were you here that night, Beth? <laughs> Listen, what? I will be a successful teacher, any teacher, but it doesn't mean you're not supposed to sit here and listen and try to learn. Huh? Because I don't have the gift of teaching, there's no excuse. Well, I ain't going back to Bible study no more. Brother Roy don't have the gift of teaching. There's something more important than me having the gift of teaching. It's what I'm teaching. How many got that? Okay? But, but there are people in the church. And by the way, can you imagine? There's probably some people here tonight that's got the ability that you could walk into a Sunday school class if you would get to the place and let God use you and show you what you have and who you are and what he wants to do with your life. We probably could have those Sunday school rooms filled. We've got room over there for 400 people in Sunday school if every room was filled. What's the next gift he talks about here? Boy, don't you wish the church had a lot more of these? The gift of exhortation. What is exhortation? How many of you just love to be criticized? <laughs> huh? There's not one of us likes to be criticized. Even constructive criticism. We don't like it, do we? Amen. Say amen. No, we don't like to be criticized. We don't like... Hey, what, what's exhortation? It's not being critical, but it's what? Uplifting, exhorting. And by the way, I'm going to tell you something. You probably can do more in the person's life by exhorting him than by what? Criticizing. Go over. Well, let's just do it. Nobody's in a hurry tonight, are they? We don't have no kids to take home tonight, so we can be here late. Any of you got a curfew there tonight or anything? All right, turn over to Revelation chapter number 2. I just thought of this. Look, look, at, look at what the Lord does. The Lord uses exhortation here. He commends the church at Ephesus. Look at it. Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. And he opens up unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith the, uh, he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Listen to what he said. He said, I know thy works and thy labors and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them what? what what's, what's the Lord doing to this church here? He's, exhort, he's commending it. He's commending it. Look, 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 look at what he says uh, uh, in verse 6. He said, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also want. What's he doing to the church? He's commending them. He's exhorting them. 
What was the missionary that went with Paul? His name means encouragement. Who knows who it is? Barnabas. Barnabas. A man of encouragement. Hey, how many of you just love to go to a church where everybody had the gift of encouragement? Huh? I mean, just instead of coming in. Huh? I mean, just think. And by the way, if you don't have the gift of encouragement, and by the way, if you don't have any, none of these gifts, it doesn't disqualify you from doing what each and every one of them tells you to do. You know that? Encouragement. How, how many of you? I, I mean, how many of you know the way you shake somebody's hand says much of what you're thinking about them? If somebody shakes your hand, they're looking at the ceiling. <laughs> if somebody shakes your hand, <laughs> that old catfish handshake, it says a whole lot about how you're feeling about that. Bro. I mean, hey, if no. you put that hand in there and sh and and don't don't. Don't break his, the bones in his hand. <laughs> How many of you remember? You remember Glenn Beam, diesel mechanic? His arms as big as my legs there. I mean, he was all muscle, Glenn was. I could see Glenn walking towards the door on Sunday morning, and I said, oh, Lord. Because <laughs> I knew... I knew that he didn't know how strong he was and I could feel the bones of my hand crushing. Let's see, exhortation. How you, how you greet someone. How, listen, I, it, it, if you come and you're down and others encourage you, it won't be long until you feel like what? Encouraging somebody else. And by the way, folks, listen. You come to church and leave church, you'll not feel like you've been beat up. You say, Brother Roy, you sure have changed, ain't you? Every once in a while you need a shearing. Every once in a while the preacher has to come like a thunderstorm. But he doesn't need to come like a thunderstorm every time. There's time. You know... I just thought of another verse. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 2, he said, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. He said what? Repute. Rebuke. But wait a minute. Some preachers, that's all they know. But what's the next word? What? What? I did leave my hearing aids at home tonight. I lost them or something. It what? Exhort. Exhort. That comes back to what we're talking about here. Uh, the gift of exhortation. The gift of encouragement. The gift of build, building up. I promise you, the church that is an encouraging church will be a church that will be touching lives. And by the way, folks, every time I walk to that pulpit, there's a multitude of problems sitting in the pew. We need help. We need help from the Lord, and we need help from what? Each other. I need you. You what? You need me. We need what? We need each other. We're to love one another. We're to edify one another. We're to exhort one another. We're to pray for one another. We're to show hospitality one for another. Amen. How many of you know what that word hospitality means? Huh? I've been here 11 years and I ain't had too many home cooked meals. Huh? 
Let, listen to me. Let, let, me. let me tell you something right here. Listen to me now. I, I, this might be uh, duck, water on a duck's back, but I'm going to say it again. If a visitor comes to church and we have the heart of exhortation and encouragement, somebody ought to go to those visitors that day and say, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to take you out to lunch today. I'd like to take you. Where, where would you like to go have lunch? You say, now, Brother Roy, that cost me something. Well, I tell you what, I believe having a spiritual church and a biblical church is one of the best things we can have today. Loving people, helping people. Colin's dad, Todd and I were eating breakfast in Birmingham, and there was a, there was a black lady and had some little kids and all. I don't remember Todd going and getting her bill, paying her bill. Hey, thinking of others. Down through the years, I've got calls and things from people, not boasting or anything, but I'm going to tell you, there's days I get down. You tell me I ain't never been down, I'm going to tell you you're lying. We'll have to get the FBI and inspect you if there's a conclude, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> but you know what I do? When I'm down, I look around for what I can do to help somebody else. And every time, that's just like going to the nursing home. Some days, when my worst days are, I just go to the nursing home. I want to tell you something. If you're having a bad day, go get you a dozen roses. Go out to NHC. Go out to the Lake Bridge. Go down to Agatha. Go to any of these nursing homes and walk in and just. I'm going to tell you something. Some of the greatest days of blessings of my life has been in a nursing home. I mean, I have got more compliments for people that don't even know they're in the world than people in the church pew. I've had them say, you're the handsomest feller I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, listen, go get you a dozen roses, walk into a nursing home, go bake you a pie, and go take it to somebody. I promise you, I promise you, if you want to get back up, learn to be an encouragement. What's the next gift? The gift of giving. Now, this doesn't mean that we're not, I, I can't give unless I've got the gift of giving. How many of you know that many people have had the gift of giving that God has used to build the kingdom of God? How many of you know anything about McCormick machinery? Farming. Anybody farmers in here? Years ago, McCormick horse pull Mowing machines. Every, McCormick made about everything that was on the farm back at the turn, back at, at, from 1890s on. You know what uh, God did? God used McCormick and his money to be able to finance men like Dwight L. Moody and other great servants of God back in that time. How many of you know who Laterno was? The great excavation of moving equipment the, and all. Laterna, he, got, he gave his life to the Lord and committed all. And he said, Lord, somebody talked about giving 10%, and this is what he decided to do. I'll keep 10% and give God 90%. How many of you know he became the richest man in the world at that time? I'm going to tell you something. You can live off what God blesses you with a whole lot more than what you think you can do on what you make. But here's the gift of what? The gift of giving. Giving. Uh, how many of you really believe this? It is more blessed to give than it is to what? Receive. How many believes that tonight? All right, I'm going to see if you do. Give me $100. I'd like to see it. 
I wonder if I went through here tonight and said, open up your billfold and give every, I, I wonder how many tonight would be willing to give everything they had away. Have you ever been to the place and God spoke to your heart and said, put it all in the offering, everything you got? In your, I've, I've argued with God. I've, I, you know, I've been in special meetings and everything and, 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 uh, and the offering being taken. Yeah, I, well, I'll put this five and the Holy Spirit starts saying, Heidi, like she gave a testimony a few weeks ago. I mean, it just keeps getting what? Louder and louder. And you finally, and I, if, you, if you don't listen, you walk out and you listen to yourself, you walk out what? Defeated. But some of the most glorious times is when I've listened and I've just give it all. I've just give it all. God has blessed me materially, church. He's blessed me materially. But when I got saved, I made a lot of right decisions. First of all, I made a decision to go back and pay everybody anything that I knew that I owed them. I went back to people in North Carolina. Glenn Garland has gone and his family is gone. I couldn't go back. There were some folks that had come. I couldn't go back and pay him for all the eggs I stole out of his chicken house. But there was a lot of people that I could. Burl Tipton. Burl Tipton and my dad traded cattle, sold cattle, sheep, horses, things and goods. But Burl Tipton... He carried a jug of moonshine in his truck the whole time, all the time. But I got saved. Burl Tipton had a store down at the mouth of the creek from where I live. I got saved, and it started bothering me, Brother Dale, about my past and all that I'd done. And, and I went to some men in church, Deacon's Church. I said, this thing is bothering me that all that I did, and I know that I need to go back. I feel I need to go back and make this right and pay these bills and everything. And, and they said, well, God's forgiven you. God save you. Don't let it bother you. And it kept bothering me. And I never will forget that I started saving so much every week out of my paycheck. I had it. And, and when I felt that I had that amount that would cover everything that I needed to do, I put it in the bank and I wrote checks. I never will forget when Burl Tipton was, I'm, I'm not been called to preach, I've just been saved a short period of time. I remember walking into Burl Tipton's store and Burl Tipton sitting there and I said, Burl, here's a check I've come to pay you. Burl looked up at me and he said, Roy, you don't owe me nothing, there's nothing on the books. I said, Burl, there's nothing on the books. But I stole rifle shells, I stole shotgun shells, I stole candy. I stole stuff out of you. I don't know how much it was, Burl, but to the best of my ability to what I think and, and the, over the years, the inner, here's a check to pay you for what? And Burl Tipton, he just sat there. He said, and literally, I can't believe this is happening. But see, God called me to preach church. I went back to North Carolina and started holding revivals in Low Mountain Church. Burl Tipton heard about me preaching a revival. And Burl Tipton came to hear me preach. Burl Tipton got saved. Amen. I never will forget, I was at Ridgeview Church in Red Hill. I was up preaching one night. And I looked back and I saw Mr. Hughes about midway in the church. Holy Spirit said, you remember the night you stole that tar out of his truck? I said, yes, Lord, I remember it. Tomorrow I'll go make it right. And I went down and I remember the old truck sitting there exactly almost where it was when I stole the tar out of it. He was up on the bank feeding his old fox hounds and I went up and he looked at me and he said, preacher, we've never had a meeting in our church like